Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Tragedies in both India and South Korea as hundreds of young people lost their lives. One from a bridge collapse, another from a stampede at a Halloween party. A special vigil was held in Friday in Lethbridge, honoring the life of Tia Blood, a young mother who died. And a federal court judge has rejected four travel vaccine mandate lawsuits. We hear her rationale for doing so. Your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. At least 132 people have died and many others were injured after a century-old cable suspension bridge collapsed into a river on Sunday evening in India. Officials say the tragedy took place in the western Indian state of Gujarat, sending hundreds of people plunging into the water. The 19th century bridge was reopened just days ago following renovations, but according to authorities, could not handle the amount of people on it. Government officials say many of those killed and injured were women, seniors and teenagers. A Canadian was among those injured in a crowd surge that killed more than 150 people in Seoul, South Korea on Sunday evening. Global Affairs Canada confirms that officials are in touch with local authorities to gather more information and provide consular assistance to those affected. South Korean officials say at least 153 people, mostly young people, were trapped and crushed to death after a huge Halloween party crowd surged into a narrow alley. There was a mix of things I heard, but there was panic coming towards us, some shouts of fear, but also confusion. We didn't know really what was happening to us or in that moment. We just wanted to feel that, that fun and freedom of Halloween 2022, finally less restrictions. It really was just meant to be fun and dress up and, and have a good time and it very quickly became more than that. It became an actual horror. There were also 133 people injured in that stampede. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau joined other international leaders in offering condolences to South Korea following that deadly stampede. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari says so many in South Korea are shaken up following the tragedy which left so many young people dead. This is a horrific story. Everyone who died was um, either in their teens or 20s, perhaps early 30s, young people who just went out to party in their costumes for Halloween. And two thirds of the crowd or more were females. These are women that were, and many of them in witch costumes. Uh, they were in at a party, they come out into an alleyway. And of course, this surge took place, uh, many of them being pronounced dead on scene. A very, very horrific and shocking story because they are so young young uh, and again going out to party for Halloween and uh, having such a such a horrific and freak accident uh, happen in this way. Lisa Daftari will also discuss how hard the Iranian regime will be clamping down on protesters in Iran right now. She'll have details coming up in the second half of our program. The families of the victims of Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 lent their voices to the worldwide calls for revolution in Iran over the weekend through a series of protests in cities across Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau attended one of the rallies in our nation's capital. We know that the Iranian regime is desperate for all of us to move on, to forget about this to shrug and say, oh, again, but Iran is always complicated, and go on to the rest of our lives. But well, we are here today, like we have been out as Canadians every weekend for the past many days, and we will say today and next week and the week after that and the months after that that we are not stopping. There are a wide variety of Christian ministries which are trying to make a difference in the lives of so many as the war between Ukraine and Russia rages on. Hanu Hauka is the founder of GCM Ministries, which is in Ukraine offering humanitarian aid, including more than 600 tons of food. Hauka says another big need right now are wood-burning stoves for the people of Ukraine. 800,000 families are, will be deprived of heat of running water uh, uh, and the ability to cook their food because of what is happening by Russian military or missile strikes at this point at this time as we speak. And so therefore, we challenge people for $100 per wood burning stove to 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 sponsor one family with a wood burning stove, which will keep them uh, uh, warm during this winter 
and it will also help them. It will be a place where they can cook their food. It's $100 per wood burning stove, and we need as many of them as possible before Christmas. More information about helping to provide a wood burning stove for a needy Ukrainian family can be found on the Great Commission Media Ministries website. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the federal government is issuing new savings bonds to help raise money for people in Ukraine. The PM announced the measure at the opening of a three-day national gathering of the Ukrainian Congress in Winnipeg. The PM also once again denounced Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Canadians will now be able to go to major banks to purchase their sovereignty bonds, which will mature after five years with interest. It'll be a lot like the Government of Canada bonds people are familiar with. These funds will go to support the government of Ukraine so they can continue to support the Ukrainian people. Former Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly says he took a more direct role in the police response to the Freedom Convoy protests last February. Speaking at the public inquiry into the government's use of the Emergencies Act, Slowly says he lost some degree of trust in his deputy chiefs as the protests continued on. He's being accused of creating confusion and dysfunction in the ranks of the Ottawa police during the protest by not abiding by the chain of command. The public inquiry will see more than 65 witnesses come forward, including Freedom Convoy organizer Tamara Leach, over the next four weeks in our nation's capital. A federal court judge who rejected the four travel vaccine mandate lawsuits has released her rationale for doing so. Justice Jocelyn Gagne wrote that there was no important public interest to justify hearing the cases. Judge Gagne said the applicants have received the remedies sought, and as such, there's no live con controversy to adjudicate. Eva Chipyuk is a lawyer with the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, and she says the lawsuits should have gone through. Very disappointing decision. I think all parties feel it. And what it is, is it's not just the four groups of applicants, but... This was an application made on behalf of over 6 million Canadians that really were challenging the government because of the loss of mobility rights. And it's quite a disappointment. I think just on ba based on those numbers alone, we can extrapolate that this is of national importance. That was Eva Chipiek, lawyer with the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms, joining us from Ottawa. Well, it was another mild day in many parts of southwestern Alberta again today. Not bad for the young trick-or-treaters heading out tonight. But that's about to change, however. Angela Stewart is out in the field at the Galt Museum. Angela, it looks like some snow mixed with rain may be on the way. Yeah, Hal, we can expect to see a mix of snow and rain starting tomorrow. Now, that rain is expected to start into the early morning hours, and then going into the afternoon, that'll change to periods of snow. Uh, that snow also sticking around on Wednesday as well. Tonight, for those trick-or-treaters, expect cloudy skies and we'll be sitting near a low of plus four. As for how the rest of the week is shaping up, I'll have all those details and much more coming up later in the show. Great. Thanks so much, Angela. Family and friends mourned the loss of Tia Blood on Friday evening. A vigil was held to pay respects to Blood, whose body was discovered on October the 24th. Video journalist Micah Quinn has more on the emotional time for family and friends as they said their final goodbyes to a wife and mother who leaves behind her husband and two young kids. I love you, Tia, and I'll do whatever I can to be there to help Paul, to help be there for you, for the boys. A large group gathered just off Range Road 225 to celebrate the life of 34-year-old Tia Blood. Her body was found just outside of Colehurst. An autopsy was completed by the Chief Medical Examiner's Office in Calgary, and RCMP confirmed that the remains of the body were of Blood's, but the manner of her death has been deemed inconclusive. Family members said she was kind and loving, and that she didn't deserve what happened to her. It's still a shock for everybody. Um, I just want want to say for everybody to keep continuing to pray for her family they're gonna need it the most right now hunter alexander frank of lethbridge has been arrested in connection to the investigation frank is charged with indignity to human remains and two counts of theft under five thousand dollars indigenous drummers played a final song for blood as well during the vigil For the young woman's friends, she meant the world to them. It didn't matter who you were or, you know, how you met her. She always had a way of brightening your day and making you feel good about yourself and making you feel loved and important as a person, as an individual. 
If you have any information regarding Blood's death, you're encouraged to call Coaldale RCMP or submit an anonymous tip through Crime Stoppers. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. For families who don't have plans to go trick-or-treating tonight, One Life Church has a great alternative for some family fun. A family fall fest will be taking place at the church where kids can go, have some crafts, play a ton of games, and even walk out with a bag of candy. A pastor with the church says this is their second year hosting this very special event. Last year we had over 150 kids and I would say about 90% of them were just from the community at large. It wasn't even necessarily our church. It was just the importance of, you know what, it's, it's been such a long time since people have been able to get together and to have that time together. That we had more parents, I think, who were interested in the event than the kids were. But it was wonderful to see all the kids here just interacting and having fun with it as well. The Family Fall Fest event at One Life Church will run until 8 o'clock this evening. While well, the sweet sounds of piano playing and tasty desserts are on the menu for a very special fundraiser in Lethbridge on November 19th at St. Augustine's Church Hall. Organizers of the event are hoping to raise money for the development of a women and youth centre in the village of Ogan, Nigeria. This project is being completed through the Christian group Bridges of Hope. Organizers say their goal is to create a centre that offers after-school programming, recreation and community resources for both women and children alike. The goal is to raise around $130,000. Organizers say if you can donate, you have a chance to become part of the history of the building as well. The plan has been marked into squares, and uh, a square will be uh, $1,000, uh, which can be paid up progressively or paid up at the event, or you can even get multiple squares, and your name will be inscribed on the display charts at the uh, Women and Youth Center when it is completed so that they may know who helped to build this house. Back in 2020, a school that was in disrepair was reconstructed in Ogan, Nigeria, and officials say it now houses over 400 students. Hundreds of Indians from across southern Alberta gathered together at Exhibition Park over the weekend to celebrate Diwali. Also known as the Festival of Lights, it's one of the most important Hindu holidays. It symbolizes the spiritual victory of light over darkness and good over evil. Local dignitaries were in attendance and they say it's not only important for political figures to show support for cultural events like this, but it's also important for everyone in our community. Just one of almost a hundred different cultures that we have here in Lethbridge. We have different languages, different foods, different celebrations. And it's so important and so much fun to take part in these fe festivals and celebrations so we can learn more about their cultures and we can spend time with them and, and develop that friendship even more. The colors, the sounds, the music, uh, and it's really important, I think, for uh, not only city council, but everybody to get out to these festivals. I was at uh, Dios Las Muertos last night for the Mexican festival. Um, and then I've, this is my second Diwali um, or Diwali. Um, a festival event um, and I think it's really great for city council members and members of the city just to get out and, and enjoy themselves. According to city officials they're in talks about the potential of building a new multi-faith temple right here in Lethbridge. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith says she may bring in a program to use billions of dollars in taxpayer funded royalty breaks to subsidize energy companies to clean up old wells. The R-Star proposal developed by an industry group has been criticized by legal experts, energy economists and the province's own internal analysts. But Premier Smith has been an advocate for R-Star, which enabled companies to claim reclamation spending against revenues to reduce their royalties. Economists say it could cost Albertans around $5 billion in lost royalties without making much of a dent in Alberta's stockpile of 170,000 inactive wells. First Nations leaders and officials with the Canadian Olympic Committee and the Canadian Paralympic Committee reacted to the B.C. government's decision not to support an Indigenous-led bid to host the 2030 Olympics in the province. It's bigger than the 2030. It's the reconciliation and working with the nations, to uh, government to government to, to move forward. And uh, I would really like to know where the priority is from the provincial government on reconciliation if it's not a priority uh, of the existing government. I'll use a term that is commonly used amongst Indigenous leaders today. Nothing about us without us. If we're looking at reconciliation, we weren't invited in the room for this decision that was shared with us yesterday. We weren't allowed the time to negotiate or have that extended dialogue 
of what the potential of an Indigenous-led process, hosted Olympic Games, would look like. Saskatchewan has added hundreds of more educational assistants to its classrooms this year. School divisions say more than 400 additional EAs are working in Saskatchewan schools compared to last fall. Hiring of educational assistants continues throughout the school year as students' needs are assessed. Minister of Education Dustin Duncan says the Saskatchewan party government will continue to ensure staffing levels meet students' needs. The Ontario Union representing 55,000 education support staff say they will be off the job Friday despite legislation banning them from going on strike. The Ford government says it will invoke the notwithstanding clause to head off any constitutional challenges of the legislation. Education Minister Stephen Lecce says the province's latest offer provides 2.5% annual wage increases over four years for workers, making less than 43000 a year. It will be 1.5% for all others. There's not a parent in this province who would be supportive of children staying home for even one day of a strike. The Premier made this clear, the government made this clear, medical and pediatric experts, teachers in the front of class have made it clear. These kids need to be in a school, in a routine, learning, getting back to basics, enough of the disruption to their lives. And this is not just an academic challenge. It causes long-term impacts to their lives, their mental and physical health too, their social development. Young, there are so many young kindergarten teachers who talk to me all the time, and probably to you. Their kids don't have basic reading skills. Stability is the important outcome we can achieve for parents, but more importantly for their kids. The union says if the legislation does pass and it's illegal to strike, members will stage a province-wide political protest on Friday. What that looks like remains to be seen. Well, we all like to spoil our pets, as after all, they're members of our families. Well, a chef in San Francisco opened what's believed to be the first fine dining tasting menu restaurant exclusively for dogs. When we make our food, it is a process. Um, it is very time consuming. There's a lot of technique. There's a lot of method and detail to what we do. Our pastries, for example, take uh, about two days on average to make. I know they're going to be eaten in two seconds. We used to work on our table manners. Our, our tasting menu is more of an experience, as much an experience for the dogs as, as it is for the owners, uh, for the humans. I, I don't know sometimes who has more uh, fun. Do you love it? Bon appetit. I wanted to celebrate him. He's so special to me. He's my poor little child, and uh, this is like the perfect place to do a really nice celebration. We're foodies too, so I guess he is too now. <laughs> I think he likes it. Yeah. It's probably not something that we would do all the time, but you know, it's his eighth birthday, so we kind of felt like we could splurge. Look, I, I've worked in restaurants for many years, um, and it's rare when, uh, as a chef, I walk into the dining room to touch tables and every single guest has a smile on their face. Uh, there, there's something very unique and satisfying about that. Like, I feel like my dog, you know, she only has a short life. Might as well try, you know, new things. And like, I like fine dining stuff for myself, so let her experience the same thing. Certified organic, certified humane, you know, uh, the, the, the nutritional aspect is the big picture. That is so cute. Well, the dog days of summer are way, way behind us here, and some much cooler temperatures may be on the way, including snow mixed with rain. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. We had some sunshine mixed with cloud today and fairly warm. Not bad for the trick-or-treaters who are out and about throughout the city. Angela Stewart is out and about in the field at Galt Gardens and has all of the weather details. Angela, the mercury is about to plummet, however, and some moisture may be on the way. Yeah, how those uh, cooler temperatures are expected to set in for this week. We can expect to also feel some wind gusts reaching up to about 50K tonight. That wind should taper off going into overnight. Uh, and we'll be sitting near a low of plus four this evening, so not too bad for those trick-or-treaters. Tomorrow dropping to a high of four degrees with periods of rain changing to snow in the afternoon. Wednesday, even cooler, slipping to minus 4 with that snow still hanging around, minus 15 overnight. As we head into Thursday, climbing up to a high of plus 1 with sunny conditions. Friday, up to 6 degrees in a mix of sun and cloud. Saturday, expect a 60% chance of snow with a high of plus 1. Looking at Sunday, there are minus 11 chilly and a chance of snow once again. We are above our average high for this time of year. 9 degrees is the average high for Halloween. The average low is minus 3. 
Now back in 1958, we reached our highest temperature, which was 20 degrees, and our lowest was a chilly minus 26 set back in 1984. 8.18 was the time that the sun rose this morning, and it set at 6.12, giving us just 9 hours and 54 minutes of daylight. Temperatures across the nation for tomorrow, a high of 9 degrees in both Victoria and Vancouver with a mix of sun and cloud. Edmonton looking at a high of 3 with a northwest wind gusting to 20k. Sun mix with some clouds for tomorrow. Minus 2 for the high in Calgary with periods of snow. About 2 centimeters is expected there. In the rest of the prairies, we're seeing periods of rain in Saskatoon with a high of plus 5. Regina, 11 degrees for the high and mainly cloudy. A mix of sun and cloud in Winnipeg and a high of 13 for Tuesday. Toronto climbing up to 17 for the day with some fog patches in the morning, but should clear out, making for a mainly cloudy sky. Ottawa's high tomorrow, 15 with a chance of rain in the morning and fog patches. 16 in Montreal tomorrow with some light rain. Fredericton clearing near noon and reaching double-digit temperatures with a high of 17. Rainy conditions in Halifax, 16 and a chance of rain in Charlottetown with a high of 15. A mix of sun and cloud with a high of 8 degrees in St. John's for Tuesday. And that's a look at the forecast from outside the Galt Museum here in Lethbridge. Are you tired of high energy bills? Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. A class action lawsuit has been settled with Canadians who only receive travel credits or vouchers when their trips or flights were cancelled during the COVID-19 pandemic. Documents show that TD Home and Auto Insurance Company has agreed to pay $4.8 million in compensation to those who were insured by a TD travel insurance policy between March of 2018 and October of 2021. The president of insurance broker Travel Secure says the settlement is good because credits or vouchers wouldn't have been enough to satisfy travelers when there was so much uncertainty around when people could travel again. Martin Firestone says travelers should be aware that COVID-19 is now considered a known cause and cannot be used as a reason to cancel a trip, but catching COVID-19 is now being treated like any other unexpected medical emergency and is covered in most cases. Inflation is not only hitting Canada and the United States pretty hard, the annual inflation rate in the European Union hit another record in October of 10.7%. That's the highest level since 1997. Higher prices for natural gas, oil and electricity fueled by cutbacks from Russia over the war in Ukraine were the major reason for the increase. The rising cost of living is dampening growth in the EU, which came in at just 0.2 percent in the third quarter. Economists are saying that a recession is not far behind. Geothermal energy is an industry that is growing rapidly here in Alberta. Now it's a heat source derived within the subsurface of the earth. Water and or steam carries the geothermal energy to the earth's surface. Lori Pusher is the president of the Alberta Energy Regulator. He says even with producers tapping into this energy source, his group has pretty high standards when it comes to protecting our province's environment. We operate at the highest standards on the planet, uh, or at least among the very highest standards uh, anywhere by compared to any other jurisdiction. And so uh, our job at the regulator is to ensure that all companies are operating at those standards. If we see something that we believe um, poses an immediate risk to the environment or an immediate risk to human health and safety, we can immediately close that uh, operation in and, and padlock it with our own locks and until such time as the producer has uh, addressed whatever issue there is, it'll, it'll remain locked and it'll be us that uh, allows them to go back into production. Lori Pusher from the Alberta Energy Regulator will explain the benefits of geothermal projects coming up after business news. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 45 points in the day to finish at 19,426. The Dow was down 128 points to 32,732. The S&P 500 was down 29 on the day to 3871. And the Nasdaq was down 114 points to 10,988. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.37 to 86.53 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 67 cents to 636 US. Gold was down 4 cents to 1633.52 US an ounce. And silver was even on the day at 1916 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.76 per bushel. Barley's at 9.91. Canola's at 19.71. And corn is at $12.09 per bushel. 
Live cattle were down 360 to 146.78. Feeder cattle were down 25 cents to 177.63. And Lean Hogs December contract was down $1.18 to 86.63. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.39 US. Recapping one of our top stories, a Canadian was among those injured in a crowd surge that killed more than 150 people in Seoul, South Korea. Global Affairs Canada confirms that officials are in touch with local authorities to gather more information and provide consular assistance to those affected. South Korean officials say at least 153 people were trapped and crushed to death after a huge Halloween party crowd surged into a narrow alley. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari says a mob of Muslim extremists attacked a Christian church in Bethlehem recently. She'll have details for us in just a moment. And listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. The Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization is looking for volunteers to take part in their Drive Happiness program. This program is to help seniors in our community who are facing extreme loneliness due to lack of accessible transportation. Volunteers drive clients to their medical appointments, pick up groceries, and take them to important life activities. If you're interested in this opportunity and for more information, visit lethseniors.com slash volunteer drivers. Lethbridge Legal Guidance is a nonprofit society offering free legal advice to low income Southern Albertans. It holds clinics on Tuesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. by appointment only. Some of the areas the society assists in include family, criminal, traffic, immigration, EI, and other issues. For more information, call 403 380 6338 or visit their website, lethbridgelegalguidance.ca. And that's today's Bridge City News community calendar. The situation is getting worse in Iran as thousands upon thousands of people continue to protest against the Iranian regime. Now to talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, clashes between protesters and security forces continued over the weekend, which left many injured and a 12-year-old boy dead. He was allegedly shot and killed. Protesters took to the streets chanting, death to the dictator. Iran has been gripped by protests since the death of 22-year-old Kurdish woman Masa Amini. Yeah, so the uh, protests continue. The courage and the bravery is only getting more intense on the part of the protesters. You know, in the last 43 years since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, which toppled the Shah of Iran, the King of Iran, uh, and brought in this Islamic regime, we've seen so many rounds of protests. Um, and the, each time the catalyst was different, right? We had the egg protests, we had economic protests, we had protests over a fraudulent election in 2009, which was called the Green Revolution. But this time around, it's different. And we have never seen the resiliency. We've never seen this level of courage, this bravery. And of course, the crackdowns are getting extremely violent alongside the courage of the people, but they keep coming out onto the streets. Imagine these teenagers, these young, young Iranian professionals, students, PhD students, I mean, teachers, and you know, every uh, profession, every sector coming out a, a, across the country. It's not just in these urban areas. It is even in rural areas and in quiet areas, which you typically wouldn't see these types of protests, but they continue to come out and to show us their bravery and to tell the world their one message. And that's that they want freedom, that they want regime change. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we each time we talk about, you know, will this be the catalyst? Will this be the, the one uh, demonstration or protest or movement that, that is successful in toppling this regime? Uh, and how, if they ever had a chance, this, this is it. This is the chance that they have, you know, this is the time that they have proven to the world that they are not backing down. They're making their message very, very clear. Hopefully we'll see some powerful changes in Iran. Lisa, the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, warned protesters that this would be their last day of taking to the streets. It appears as though security forces may intensify their fierce crackdown on the nationwide unrest.
Yeah, they 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 have made threats many times, but this time around, they wanted to draw some sort of line in the sand to say, as of tomorrow, it will be a bloodbath. And perhaps it, it will be because we have seen this from the regime. This is the Achilles heel of this regime, is the people coming out onto the streets. They are fearful of such a grassroots movement that has taken on this 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 incredible steam and momentum. Uh, and you know, on the other hand, we have reports of members of Basij uh, and Revolutionary Guard families, you know, take, getting uh, visas and passports, trying to get their families out of the country. I mean, that tells us that they are fearful. That tells us that they want to get out of harm's way and get their families out of harm's way, uh, which is good news. You know, it, it may intensify. We might see more bloodshed. And it's very unfortunate because that death toll is going to climb. The number of detainees is going to rise. But on the other hand, we can see that they the protests are actually effective in scaring this regime and, and perhaps making many of them flee and getting out of the country. Uh, so we will continue to keep our eyes on it. And, and I thank you, Hal, for bringing attention to this story. The Iranian people, the messages I get from Iran daily are very repetitive and they are A, thanking any Western media outlets that are covering the story and B, asking us not to leave them alone, to give them support. As you know, we do not have many reporters on the ground in Iran for security reasons, uh, but the Iranian people, even though the internet is cut off, they are citizen journalists. They try to get us their stories themselves. And we've seen this as of 2009. So they have used social media. They have used these platforms to uh, inform the world, to create awareness about their plight. And um, the, the least we can do is to amplify their voices where, where they do not have any themselves. Absolutely. You know, Lisa, while some countries have been quite hesitant, the European Union is considering listing Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a terror group. Right. And you know what? Uh, each time this happens, whether it's in Canada or the United States or now the European Union, you know, the, the first reaction we all have is what took so long? You know, obviously, the Revolutionary Guard is, is almost a, a terrorist entity. Why, uh, you know, hesitate? We're seeing this, you know, with a lot of pressure on Canada to uh, enlist them, even though uh, Canada has been very brave in coming out and saying, you know, we, we could condemn this and we condemn the government. And that's a big step forward. I know the Iranian people are very grateful to the Canadian leadership for that. But again, what's taking so long to, why the hesitation to call a terrorist group a terrorist group? Uh, and the European Union is finally coming around to perhaps doing that and putting them on the terror list. This means uh, they will not be able to travel freely. Their family members won't be able to, uh, you know, hide out in these European nations. And, you know, just to create this juxtaposition, they are cracking down on people's children. A, a young girl who's 22 years old lost her life because she was not wearing these Islamic headscarf the way that they wanted or the way that the morality police wanted her to. But then again, their own children are gallivanting in Europe and in Canada and the United States and the best universities wearing designer clothing, wearing bikinis, and they post pictures of themselves on social media. So there is no shame in their game. And this is what people are trying to call out. Do not give them the benefits of uh, coming to Western or European nations. Do not give them the benefits of you know using banking systems, put sanctions on them. We can do whatever we can diplomatically at the very least to curtail the influence of the Islamic regime here in the West. Bringing things a little closer to home for just a moment here, there are reports from the U.S. Department of Justice that the IRS and some of their employees ripped off COVID relief programs and used the cash to splurge on trips to Vegas, some fine jewelry, and even shopping sprees, which included Gucci accessories. Can you explain? My goodness, right? I mean, on the one hand, who's surprised, right? The IRS trying to catch fraud, but yet being the biggest fraudsters themselves. Um, it's no shock. And as you know, here we have um, the uh, economic bill that is going to add about 87,000 new IRS employees that will uh, be fo focusing on catching fraud in, in the middle and low lower socioeconomic brackets. So, I mean, clown town, right, in the IRS. So here is a report that exposes um, IRS employees that they, uh, they ripped off the IRS to the tune of about half a million dollars. And exactly as you said, spending it on, on trips and on spa, uh, day spas, um, going shopping to uh, none other than Gucci, um, a, a lot of fraud. But you know, this is, this is what the bureaucrats do. They rip off, uh, you know, law abiding citizens. And here you have it, in, uh, in, in print, in a report that this, in fact, did happen. And of course, with the pandemic and COVID relief funds, there was a lot more opportunity and vulnerability for fraud. Uh, and of course, they took that opportunity. You know, frankly, I'm surprised it was only half a million dollars. 
That's uh, quite shocking. Lisa, you're reporting on the foreign desk that a mob of Muslim men attacked a Christian church in a suburb of Bethlehem located south of Jerusalem on Friday night. Now, one church leader from the Forefathers Orthodox Church called the attack simply horrific. Right. And, you know, as you know, Hal, uh, there has always been this fixation on persecuting Christians uh, in the Middle East, um, in, in all sorts of, of, of countries and places by different groups. So we've seen it in Egypt by the Muslim Brotherhood. We have seen it in Lebanon by uh, Hezbollah. We have seen it in uh, Syria and uh, Iraq by ISIS and other insurgencies. And of course, in Israel, where it's the only place where Christians actually do have a haven. And it's the only place in the last two decades where the number of Christians has either remained the same or increased, whereas the number has dwindled in all other Middle Eastern countries because of that persecution. Uh, now we have a church outside of Bethlehem, an area that, of course, a lot of Christians live and live comfortably and safely. And here you have uh, Islamists infiltrating and attacking them and, uh, and where in church where they feel the safest, where they feel like, you know, they are, you know, free to worship and free to live and free to be. Uh, here you have an attack. So, um, you know, this is something that we've covered very, very much at the foreign desk, like Christian persecution in the Middle East. Um, and of course, with the pandemic and everything happening, people are looking much more locally in their own countries, in their own cities, in their own provinces and states. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a very important story and something that we shouldn't take our eyes on attention off of. But that is global persecution for religious minorities, and particularly in the Middle East, the fixation, again, being on uh, Christian minorities. Very, very sad. Lisa, Lebanon's President Michel Aoun left the presidential palace on Sunday, marking the end of a six-year term, and he left without a replacement. The country is leaderless right now. Right. And uh, the last thing the Middle East uh, nation needs is a political vacuum. That's exactly what has been created. If you've been following uh, what's been going on in Lebanon over the last uh, six or seven years, it's a lot of uh, political um, just uh, chaos, for lack of a better word, with leaders being uh, voted in, voting voted out. Their prime minister is, is an interim minister right now. But more importantly than anything else, you have this influence of Hezbollah over the country like a cancerous sword. And every time there is this political vacuum or this uncertainty, of course, those are the groups that make the gains. Those are the groups that win over certain segments of the population and increase their influence on the country. And that is exactly what the fear is right now. Now, we had news about a newly renovated bridge collapse in India, Lisa, where more than 100 people tragically lost their lives. There was also tragedy in South Korea recently when 153 died in a Halloween crowd surge. Tell me more about that. Oh, this was a horrific story. Everyone who died was um, either in their teens or 20s, perhaps early 30s, young people who just went out to party in their costumes for Halloween. And two thirds of the crowd or more were females. These are women that were, and many of them in witch costumes. Uh, they were in at a party, they come out into an alleyway. And of course this surge took place, uh, many of them being pronounced dead on scene. A very, very horrific and shocking story because they are so young uh, and again going out to party for Halloween and uh, having such a such a horrific and freak accident uh, happen in this way. Very, very sad. Lisa, the Russian attacks in Ukraine continue unabated. What's the latest? Are there any peace talks planned between Ukraine's Zelensky and Russia's Vladimir Putin? It looks like we're getting farther and farther away from any prospect of, of peace talks or talks in general. Uh, Putin is um, perhaps beginning to claim some victories in certain segments or seg certain parts of Ukraine, while Zelensky is just going on, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, fundraising sprees, asking for more money and weapons from Western states, and he's getting them, which is very, very shocking at this point because it's uh, just throwing good money after bad and uh, trying to fix the situation in Ukraine by giving the Ukrainian some some level of financial uh, and military support, but yet again, um, no end in sight for this war. And of course, the people of Ukraine, uh, there are some horrific stories that we're covering at the foreign desk with women being raped, being hanged, um, just just horrific. And uh, again, of course, the people being um, right in the, in the in the center of all of this. Uh, we know that there is obviously a an immigration crisis with Ukrainians trying to leave to neighboring uh, countries um, and many of them staying and rolling up their sleeves and saying, this is our home and we will fight for it. 
So um, a lot of, of bloodshed, a lot of senseless deaths coming from there. But again, until Putin decides that he's going to stop this or claim victory once and for all, I don't think we're going to see any end in sight, unfortunately. You know, we brought in thousands of refugees, Ukrainian refugees here into Canada and uh, welcomed them with open arms. It's so wonderful to see them escape the war-torn country. But Lisa, let me ask you something. Is there a point in time when the United States, the Biden administration, or maybe other countries will say, we don't have any more money or weapons to give you. We need them for our own country or for other international affairs. Is there a point in time where governments say, I'm sorry, but enough's enough. We don't have anything more that we can give. Yeah, great question, Hal, because you would think that that point had already passed. A report actually came out late last week here in the United States where a very uh, experienced general said, wait a minute, if there should be an invasion of Taiwan by China, we don't have enough military aid to give out or military um, support to give out because of what we have spent in uh, Ukraine which is it's an incredible thing to say out loud and it's an incredible fact in and of itself uh, to think that we have really put all of our proverbial eggs in this basket of Ukraine that does not look like it will be a victory for Ukraine or for anyone uh, for that matter. It has taken so long that at best we're going to see a, a divided segmented Ukraine with uh, Russia claiming victory in, in certain segments. I mean, what can potentially happen or what what can the aid that the United States and the Western nations and, and Europe provides uh, Ukraine, what could it, it, it what would be the best case scenario? Uh, and I think it, it's interesting to look, you know, and weigh it out with the pros and cons and to say, we just keep supporting this war. Uh, but this the report that, that came out and we covered it at the foreign desk, it's very interesting to see how the United States, you know, just keeps going back into the, the piggy bank and, and supporting this. Foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure. We are pleased to have the president and CEO of Alberta Energy Regulator joining us today from Calgary to discuss the future that lies ahead for part of Alberta's energy resources. Mr. Laurie Pusher, thanks so much for joining us today. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Now, with all of the various government agencies and levels of government, can you really explain the role of the Alberta Energy Regulator that's been around for 83 years? What's your mandate? Well, we uh, came together under the new label, Alberta Energy Regulator, seven or eight years ago. And the mandate at that time was to, to be a full life cycle regulator. And for us, that means you apply to us to actually drill a well, right through reclaiming it when uh, it's completed its productive life. So we're the place you have to come after you've been given the right to explore or develop any, any oil or gas product in the province. Now, we often hear from our Alberta politicians that our province has pretty high standards for energy resource development. Now, in your opinion, Laurie, how do our environmental standards and treatment of industry workers compare to other countries? Well, I think it's fair for Albertans to know that we operate at the highest standards on the planet, uh, or at least among the very highest standards uh, anywhere by compared to any other jurisdiction. And so uh, our job at the regulator is to ensure that all companies are operating at those standards. One of the things we uh, are working on right now is to increase the access to the data we have and the knowledge we have. So you'll see over the next while, um, an expansion of a new product we have on our website called our Data Hub. And you can see how industry is performing on water usage, air emissions, and, and a number of things like that. Uh, as a regulator, we're not going to get into too much uh, around whether we're the best or the worst or whatever. That's for government and others to talk about. We want to be the trusted source of information on how industry is performing, and, and then uh, that'll inform a good conversation for all Albertans. So when a company doesn't adhere to your standards, what kind of steps do you take to ensure that they do? Well, we here in Alberta have a very wide-ranging uh, uh, number of options to deal with uh, problems. If we see something that we believe um, poses an immediate risk to the environment or an immediate risk to human health and safety, we can immediately close that uh, operation in and, and padlock it with our own locks and until such time as the producer has uh, addressed whatever issue there is, it'll, it'll remain locked and it'll be us that uh, allows them to go back into production. Those are extreme cases where we see an imminent risk. We have a series of administrative tools we can use to bring someone into compliance. Uh, 
And then of course, we also have penalties of our own that we can issue for fines. And then we can also review, refer the matter to the justice or to our colleagues in justice for more formal prosecutions. We find by and large, uh, it's very rare that we have to get to issuing fines. Our administrative uh, operations or our administrative tools can be pretty powerful in terms of ultimately, if someone isn't complying, we start taking away their right to operate or their right to continue to do business. So uh, it really lean, lets us lean in pretty hard. It means we don't have to, to say it very often most of the time. So it is very rare, right? So, Lori, when it comes to resource development, what role does Alberta Energy Regulator play in the rights of landowners? Well, landowners are a great ally for us in the work we do at the regulator. Um, you know, they're so close to the operations out there. Uh, our field team are out there doing inspections and monitoring, but a landowner is right there and can see what's going on. So we will be involved in any complaints around the operations uh, we don't get involved in the commercial relationship around rents and those things, but if a landowner thinks something doesn't look right on a site or there's an odor complaint or uh, something doesn't look uh, as, as they might think it should, then, then we're the people to call and we'll come out and have a look and, and uh, get the company moving in the right direction. Is there much of a relationship between our post-secondaries or universities and colleges here in the province and your group as Alberta-based researchers really look to develop new energy resources? Well, we're home to the Alberta Geological Survey. And so uh, as the province has moved in, into their new mineral strategy, we're, we're through that geological survey very actively involved in a lot of work. There are a lot of collaborations with, with uh, academic institutions across the province. Our, our uh, core research center, which houses every single piece of core that's ever been drilled in this province, it's a massive facility. It actually exists on the University of Calgary uh, site and and there are a lot of academic researchers in and out of that space every day. So there's good collaborations in those spaces. As we look into these new mineral resources and geothermal and brine minerals and, and where there might be other uh, mining opportunities in the province, uh, we expect to be seeing more and more of that type of collaboration. You know, certain politicians have talked about really tapping into more of the mineral resources here in the province and reaching out to many other markets, larger markets around the world. Can you talk about the development when it comes to our mineral resources? Is it pretty big right now? There's, it's pretty modest right now in Alberta. Alberta's, uh, the, the folks at the survey tell me there are mineral opportunities in the province. One of the challenges Alberta's had over the years is you always ran into oil or natural gas at such uh, profound opportunities. It was hard to keep looking for something else. We have couple active projects right now doing uh, pilots on geothermal development, and that would be large-scale geothermal where you're drilling a, something akin to an oil well to, to produce uh, that, that heat resource. Right. Uh, there's a couple of those underway in the province. We have uh, in the brines, there's a lot of water that's produced in association with gas or oil, and there's a lot of minerals in those brines, and, and so there's a pilot project uh, or two underway right now uh, to find new ways to process those those minerals out of those brines. So that's advancing. And then the geological survey just did a massive uh, piece of public geoscience that we're, we're busy trying to get disseminated out and we can talk more about it if you like, but taking a, a look across the province at where other opportunities might exist. We hear a lot about orphaned wells here in Alberta. Lori, can these abandoned sites be utilized in the geothermal process? Well, there's lots of people looking to see what the opportunities might look like in that space and whether some of the existing wells and infrastructure out there can be used. One of the key things about the geothermal resource, though, is controlling that, uh, that energy uh, really is essential to it. If, if you ever lost uh, the uh, uh, reservoir pressures or any of those types of things, your, your resource kind of evaporates on you. So it's a pretty active conversation right now of whether it's better to develop a new well so you have full control of it or repurpose existing wells. And we'll see how, how industry innovates in that space. Tell me about the connection or maybe the relationship between geothermal and the oil and gas sector. Well, if you see a geothermal well being drilled, you won't know it. It looks like you're drilling an oil well or a gas well. So they're very similar in that respect. The difference will be once they move towards production. And so we have lots of opportunities for production where you have injection and, and uh, extraction occurring in paired wells or things like that. 
that's a bit of the foundation of geothermal. The difference will be there will become a, there, a generator will be located there at some point in time. So a turbine would be installed and, and you'd be doing that, or it would be connected in for use as a heating operation if, if you've got a facility nearby that you want to heat. What has been the appetite so far from industry relating to Alberta's geothermal resources? Um, it's, it's, I guess, some preliminary steps is really all that's happened. We know there's, there's a number of companies that are looking at the resource, and we have a couple of pilot projects underway as we speak, but we haven't seen it. It's a couple of years away from seeing a, an operational industry out there. Can you give us maybe a brief snapshot of what geothermal projects do for Alberta communities? Well, it'll depend on on how how successful they are in in uh, exploiting the resource. There's there's differing opinions on how valuable the resource is and where the right places are. I know out towards Drayton Valley, up in the Fox Creek area, there's some people think there's a pretty good resource in there, um, and it's going to take some time to prove out just the viability of that. What it would mean in the long term is you would have a good, reliable, uh, clean source of energy. Uh, uh, with very little, if any, carbon emissions. And so that would be pretty encouraging. Um, I know of a couple of projects right now that, but they're still pretty small. So, you know, in the overall generation strategy, it'll be a small factor for a few years. How about some projects in our region here, maybe in southwestern Alberta, Lethbridge, or even south southeastern Alberta near Medicine Hat? Well, I, I'm off the top of my head. I, I don't think there's any geothermal projects down there right now. One of the interesting opportunities down towards Medicine Hat is the emergence of helium. And the helium resource is in pretty high demand right now. It's used in uh, not just helping yourself talk like Mickey Mouse, but it's also used in, uh, in uh, a lot of medical procedures. It's a key element used in MRIs as an example. Um, so there's a lot of exploration and development underway in that space. And so we'll watch the build out of that, but there's no question there'll be a lot of growth in that area. So, Laurie, let's talk more about geothermal. Will this eventually be similar to what we're seeing in Iceland, where they not only have the hot water pools, but also heating homes and sidewalks with geothermal resources? Well, that's yet to be proven in terms of the, the scale or the size of the geothermal resource that might be available in Alberta. You know, for Iceland, it's so much closer to the surface that, that the resource doesn't degrade the same way it might here, depending on the depth they're coming from. So we'll see how it proves out over time. But it's certainly there will be geothermal energy produced in Alberta. There's no question about that. Now let's talk about its impact and benefits of geothermal resources. And let's talk a bit about the extraction work. Lori, how does the work impact the land and environment when compared to that of the oil and gas sector? It's going to look and, and seem a lot like an oil and gas operation. The difference would be there's not hydro, hydrocarbons being produced. And so, you know, the risk... Uh, will be a little bit different. There will be brine circulating and some of those things as, as part of it. So it'll really depend on, on that. But, I, you know, they're, they're, they're high-performing uh, industries and we expect they'll be operating at very high standards. So it should look akin to a, an oil or natural gas facility. And, and uh, you know, they're in, the, they're in the environmental space. So we expect them to be very mindful of, of the site and how they operate their sites. What about the long-term benefits geothermal resources could provide to Albertans and resource companies? Well, I think you might have to talk to some people uh, uh, beyond us. We are a regulator who's here to make sure it's done properly. There will be others that will be forecasting what the generation mix in Alberta will be. Right now, it'll be a few years before you see uh, geothermal being a resource that starts to play a significant role in the total generation of the province. So I, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and the scale they'll be able to generate. What are some of the challenges that uh, geothermal businesses are running into right now, trying to develop this resource? Well, it, it's going to be understanding how the resource is going to perform. So you talked about Iceland. I mean, that's, that's very near surface. They have good understanding of how, how much heat they'll be able to extract. Uh, you know, some of the geothermal resources here are at deeper depths, and therefore it'll be a little while as they prove out the, the long-term performance of those assets. Now you have framework put in place that we discussed a little bit earlier. Let's talk about the framework development. And does it come as a result of requests from established businesses looking to develop our geothermal resource? 
we have we have an opportunity within our regulatory structures to create a pilot regulation and we started with geothermal that way where we hadn't built geothermal regulations at that point in time so we were able to build a pilot project with them it works well for them but it also works well for us because we can learn how to how to regulate the facility alongside industry as they develop um, but we have just released our new regulatory structure around geothermal, and that gives companies good predictable uh, understanding of what the expectations are, and they can go on about their business of planning their projects. So, Laurie, big picture here. Do you have any projections of how large the geothermal sector could really grow in Alberta? We haven't done much forecasting yet on it. Um, we do an annual energy forecast. It's uh, we call it ST98. It's a, it's a forecast of the amount of oil and gas and other things. And we're continuing to add resources to that over time. So, you know, we will be getting into that space, but right now it's still pretty, pretty early days to give a good reliable forecast. Lori Pushers, the CEO of Alberta Energy Regulator. Thanks so much for joining us today from Calgary. Thank you very much. Appreciated the, the chat. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.